Okay, hello everybody. I am uh, WCM Zoe Varney, aka Horsey Chass, and I am joined today by the wonderful Grandmaster Keith Arkell, who is a fan favourite of many of you um, in Britain, and he will be doing an interview with me today with questions written by your other favourite Grandmaster, uh, Danny Gormali, so that should be interesting. Keith, do you want to just introduce yourself quickly? Well, hi Zoe. It's absolutely lovely to be here. Um, well, I'm I'm um, I'm a grandmaster. I'm a grandmaster. <laughs> I don't need to say anymore. Um, and I love playing chess. And um, I've spent my whole life playing chess. Um, I'm not going to list my achievements. I've done a few things. <laughs> you, can, you can ask me my you can ask me about what I've done. But yeah, that's yeah. You start by saying, "Nice to meet you." <laughs> Okay, and big so, I hope Danny's questions aren't too. <laughs> yeah, I, I have I have checked Danny's questions. So, question one is: What inspired you to play chess? Okay, I love the moves. I mean, I love the moves really late in life. Like I learned them, um, well, relative to kind of today. I learned the moves when I was like nearly thirteen. My dad came home from work one day and um, he just showed chess to, to, to my brother and myself. I think because of like, the Fisher, there was like this massive boom because of the Fisher Spassky match. Like, the, you know, there's, there's gen, you know, re really a lot of interest in chess that time. He's in the news every day and stuff like that. And so my dad came back from work, showed me and my brother. And we were like really competitive and we kind of, we, we kind of just started playing each other like non stop. And um, we were like, we were like kind of, gambling with our record collections we were like playing each other for like for like you know it's got, it's like jimmy osmond my long-haired lover from liverpool and and, and, and david cassidy all those crappy records record collection. we used to gamble over our record and um and and so we're really really competitive we played like hundreds and hundreds of games against each other so we and we kind of we got good quite quickly and we and um we um you know became like the best players in the school and that kind of stuff which was great for my confidence because you know i wasn't a very confident person as a kid, I was like kind of, you know, quite self effacing and, and low self esteem and all that kind of stuff that, that um, I guess lots of things have got. And, um, and, and, and chess gave me a massive confidence and I absolutely loved it. And so I just, all, all I wanted to do was play chess and be in chess environments because I felt good in chess environments. So um, when um, I kind of quit, quit education, I'm not quite a bright guy, but I quit education and uh, I wanted to do chess. I lived with my parents, paid, um, paid, um, um, the keep to play tournaments and um, and and then started just playing tournaments as a kind of 2,100 strength player, and then slowly worked my way towards becoming an IM, which I succeeded in doing, and and so on. Just gradually worked my way up. Um, yeah, but I just the ins inspiration. I just I love the environment, and I like them being. I guess I like being good at something by by chance. <laughs> that, that I did get good at it. So. That's really, really nice. It was a similar thing for me, actually, with my brother. We were just playing non-stop. We'd come home from school and just, like, play chess for hours. Who was the stronger, who was the stronger now and who was the stronger generally out of the two of you? Normally me growing up at first. I think partly because I was older, like a year older, so... Oh, well, one year. Same as me and my brother, one year. Yeah. And then nowadays, most of the games we play, I win a pawn and then we end up getting a draw. Um, At least... Yeah, he's better than me at blitz. I'd say I'm probably better at standard play. So, so it's quite close then. If you yeah. both, you kind of, but you'll yeah. you'll get more, you'll get more opportunities. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're female. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, the next question is: What ambitions do you still have for your chess? Um, I, I think kind of actually. As the years go by, I'm 61 now. As the years go by, I think it's kind of like just by staying the same level, if I can do that. I mean, I don't want to stay the same level. I want to keep improving. I mean, I'm learning stuff. I learn stuff all the time. I'm still learning about chess. But I've maybe, maybe possibly your brain slows down a little bit as you get older. But um, but in general, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I want to kind of maintain my level, possibly still improve a little bit. I mean, I certainly, I, peak, I mean, at, at 53 and 54, I was certainly stronger than I, I'd ever been in my life. I mean, like, at that at that time, I got I got four grandmaster norms in a row, which I've never done in my life before. That I, I got I can't remember the four tournaments. So I got a grandmaster norm at um, the Isle of Man, a really strong tournament, like playing Shorts and Adams and those guys. Yeah, I got plus two in a really strong tournament. Got a norm there, and I got a norm at um, the World Senior, um, 
and I got a Norma Hastings, Jim Norma Hastings, and then and then I got a Norma to, at the Vienna Open. I won this big kind of five hundred pound tournament in Vienna. Played song, so I kind of made four Gem Normas at the age of fifty three. So I kind of that's the strongest I'd ever been, and, and, and um, so I kind of stuff like age doesn't at the moment it doesn't bother me. I mean, maybe at some point it will it will, it will kick in and, and yeah, but so um, so my ambition is just to kind of like. Kind of stay the same. Hopefully, get a bit better, and then maybe, 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 um, maybe there'll be maybe um, there'll be world and European over sixty-five titles that I can play for. Because one of the things that inspired me was like suddenly Fide announced that, um, at, like when I when I was about fifty-three, Fide announced that that the European and Senior Championships would switch from fit like sixty plus to fifty plus. And I thought, oh, this is really exciting. I want I want I want to go for that. I feel like I'm stronger than these guys. So I kind of went. I got really inspired and kind of worked a little bit on my chest, yeah, and got this new energy to want to achieve stuff. And um, and I played in the European Senior, and and I and I managed to win it. And um, and then I then I played in the the, the World one at the end of the year. That's two thousand fourteen. And um, and I kind of yeah, it was a really strong talk that one was. He had some really really top players, and and I managed to kind of come in first in that one as well, and just lost out on on some random tie break. So I kind of realised that you can get you can get stronger. If you're if you're motivated, motivation is everything. I think a lot of people as they get older, they don't, they lose their motivation. They just don't want to bother. They just want to take it easy. They've done what they want to do in life already. But I'm not like that. I just you know I go to a tournament. I go to I really want to win. You know I want to beat people. I want to still make make progress. So but yeah. So what do I specifically want to do? Um, I mean, there's some rating numbers. I want to go back ahead of uh, over 2,500. I want to, you know, kind of, yeah, you know, kind of, yeah. You know, I want to get back ahead of Danny. I want to get back ahead of Danny just to, you know, a lot of competition keep, between the two. Keep him on his toes. Keep him on his toes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because I think out of all the players, I think Danny's the player that I've kind of got the most equal score against. It's like almost every game we've had a few quick draws. But almost every game has ended in a draw, or he's won a few and I've won a few. But it's really, really tight. And um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I want to keep up with Danny. What? Um, <laughs> Um, but um, but yeah, it's hard to say what the ambitions are. I mean, I guess maybe some writing type stuff. I mean, maybe I've got a few more books on the horizon. I, just, I, I mean, I wrote, I wrote, um, I did Arkham's Odyssey, which is like full autobiography. I've then I did that. Yeah. Oh, nice one. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. I like and um, then I did, oh, thanks. Then I did, um, then I did, <laughs> then I did uh, the, the ending one. Arca's endings, and then the next one is going to surprise everyone. It's going to be like Arca's combinations because everyone thinks I'm like boring in that player, and I just swap off pieces and keep the simple because I can't calculate. So I've got Arca's endings on the horizon. So, so yeah, like writing's good. Um, another thing, like to see where the invites go and see what and see what I can do in my. I mean, right, uh, ambition wise, I, I guess you've got to say senior stuff. Maybe try and get the senior titles, world titles, and rating wise, just. Try and get back at the twenty five hundred and, and um, see what see where that leads where that leads me. I think I'd love to see you and Danny both play the same weekend now and see how that goes. <laughs> he probably says I'm rubbish. He probably says, "Oh, that after he's no good." <laughs> he he regretted not playing the a one you won a few weeks ago because he said he wanted to go there and win it instead of you. I could easily have seen him making the top three, but I don't know about winning. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been interesting. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah, no, we've got, we've got. To, I think, I think actually, it's quite a playful rivalry because we both got a bit of a sense of humour. I think we have a playful rivalry, but I don't, I don't think it's real. Maybe the two of you should have like a big blitz match, online blitz match. Okay. Like, high stakes. Okay. He's he's very good online. He's very good online. I mean, his online rating is about two hundred points higher than mine. But what I think, I'll tell you the reason why is because he never plays in these tournaments where you berserk. He like you know he commentates on these like. These Bundesliga things with, with with Natasha sometimes, and and um, but he's never he doesn't play like like you know like you know you know what berserking where yeah. you kind of play with half the, half the time. Well, if it's like three plus two, and then and you're playing instead with like you know they've got their three plus two, and you've got like one and a half minutes and no increment. Yeah. and it's like I do that I do that all the time. So I'm like it, it kind of keeps your rating really low, but mm-hmm. like um, but it's kind of good for the team because you get points, you get like five 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 five. So, so um, but yeah, no, Dan, Danny's got a Danny's got. A, I think maybe Danny is better than me at online, like online blitz. I mean, yeah. Um, um, if, if, if if someone said to us like you two are having you two are having a race to like I don't know, say twenty eight fifty on light chess, and there's like you know like a thousand pound prize, then I think it'd be unclear. 
I didn't think we ever could because, you know, we'd just be like, just, you know, playing when we just short sessions when we're feeling kind of, um, you know, when we're, um, um, you know, we'd have a little rest. You know, you'd get fit to play. It's interesting play. to do something similar to the chess.com speed chess championships where you have like, an, is it 90 minutes of five plus one and then 60 minutes of three plus one and then 30 minutes of one plus one? See, because that, yeah. that would test stamina as well. That'll and be fun. Danny That'll would need fun. the toilet every game. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's true. I gave lots of time. Yeah, but I mean, it's like I mean, it's not just damage. It's like I mean, I mean, so I mean, kind of my kind of my rivals are some of my best chess friends. I mean, like Simon Williams is brilliant, and um, and you know, size in the same kind of ballpark, and Mark Hebden as well. I mean, Mark's always Mark's had a successful career playing chess, and um, you know, kind of I guess my rivals in a way are the kind of people, yeah, you know, not not the very young people because they're just going to go whoosh. <laughs> They're going to be on catching the scene. But, yeah, so yeah. Ra- Ravi did very well in the Gibraltar Battle of the Sexes thing. Um, who, sorry, who was Ravi? Oh, Ravi's, Ravi's just no. Ravi's a no, Ravi's somebody who just kind of like went from he was stuck around twenty three hundred for ages, and he suddenly like just took off, and he suddenly like just shot you know cruised to GM, and you know he's, well, but, but, you know knocking he's twenty five hundred or knocking on the door. Well, he's twenty five hundred now, and just going in a going in a you know just rapidly on his way to, to maybe super gym who knows but yeah he's, he's impressed the way he's taken off but we needed a breakthrough like that because we haven't i think in the last kind of decade we've had like only like two new gms i mean like before ravi i think it was danny fernandez before danny fernandez it was jonathan hawkins before jonathan hawkins it was david howell david, yeah. david howell was our fourth latest gm and he's been a gym for ages yeah so like you know we need we need some of these young players to kind of break through so it's good about ravi stuff Okay, thank you. So your third question is, why are you a good endgame player? I'm mean, part of it's experience. But it's not only experience. I'm mean, part of it is because I've just been playing like for ages and ages and, and I've just got used to how to play certain kinds of positions. But that's not the that's not the, the total that's not the only explanation. I think um I mean I, I kind of realised quite early on that in positions where there's not many pieces on the board, I start, I feel really comfortable. I can't explain I don't know why, I just feel really comfortable. It's like, I can, you know, nothing really horrible is going to happen. It's not like a muddle. It's like, it, it's very clean and clear cut. You know, like, I mean, I, I've got to, I remember like in 1990-something, I got to this um, queen and rook pawn against queen position against this guy called Panzer in Hastings Challenge. It's, it's in one of my books. And um, and I was able to, I was sitting at the board and I, I was able to, I, was, I, can, I'm, I was able to calculate really long, long variations. Like, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to stop his checks and push my pawn at the board. But I was like seeing, he, you know, long thing check out there, check there, check there, check. Oh, I forgot there. He goes check, check, check. There. Then I've got a cross check, and that ends the checks, and the pawn goes on. Him. And I was able to, and I could, I could calculate these really long lines, and um, and and you can't do that actually. You can't do that in in a middle game. You can't calculate long lines because um, we well, can't. There's too many, there's so many branches, aren't there? Like yeah. you know, you, and you've got like. You know, six candidate moves, and each one of them is like a number of replies. So most of the time, in the middle game, you're not actually doing much calculating. But but in the ending, because I think I'm a good calculator, and in the ending, um, calculation is very important. And um, that I think that may be it. I'm good at calculating. Um, I don't know any other explanation. Um, but I, I kind of, but it, maybe it's feel as well. Like I kind of, I kind of feel what what pieces need to be swapped off. I'm good at using the king and kind of playing for mates in end games and, and kind of, I don't know. Um, but yeah, combination of calculating and just feeling where the pieces go. And it's no, there's no muddle, there's no, because what I don't like in chess is when it's like incalculable positions, like just a mess. I don't like a mess, like where it's just like, they're, they're, they're initially so strong on one part of the board and you're initially so strong on another part of the board that you just can't work it all out. It's just a race and just see what happens. Yeah. I don't like that kind of thing. I, I like something that's clear that can be, I'd rather have I'd rather have um, a slight advantage that I'm in complete control of than like something where it's probably plus four, but there's all sorts of stuff they can throw at me and I can't possibly foresee it all. That's really yeah, interesting, so, actually. Yeah. But it's the clarity. It's the clarity that I think. Is so I think important. I had a blitz game against you in one of those checkmate COVID things or British blitz qualifiers or something, and I won a pawn, and then you just managed to win the end game, and I was like, how? Like, <laughs> you were a pawn down, and you just completely crushed me in the end game. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it was impressive. It was very impressive. I think you've done that quite a lot over the board as well, um, even slightly worse end games I've seen. And then it would be something, and everyone would just be like, oh, this is just going to be a draw, and then like a couple of hours later, you've won the game. 
Um, yeah, have one quite a lot of ending. Here. That's good. That's good. I think, I think my phone gets impatient. Or, and I think <laughs> actually, what happens? And, and I think I've seen it. So you know, Magnus is a big hero of mine. I don't, I don't, I'm not, don't want to anticipate any future questions, but like, I, I, I really. I really love the way Magnus presses. And, and what you what you notice all grinders, I mean, my heroes in the past were like people like Karpov and Ol Fanderson and even Tony Arrow and Tony Marvel. What was that um, when they grind and grind away and press and press and press, often the opponent, however strong they are, if it's like a super GM, they their final their final mistake is actually quite a trivial mistake. And it's the accumulation of all the pressure. You know, they play accurate in defence for hour after hour after hour. And it's really hard for anybody to, to sustain accurate defence if you, if you continue to put them under pressure. So, you know, there's it's a lot of games where people say, oh, how can, how can they play, how can they defend so badly against them? How can, they, how can they make such a blunder? But it's like the accumulation. It's like, yeah, yeah it's after 40 accurate defensive moves that that final blunder came. And, uh, but, yeah, it's, uh, also I enjoy endings. So, I think that helps, doesn't it? If you, I mean, I really don't like openings. I don't. I can't. I hate openings. I hate looking at just looking at an opening book or like it doesn't doesn't attract me. I don't like it. Doesn't lead to anything. Like it's a, it's a rat race. It's like if I learn everything, and then my person learns everything, then we just we're just kind of going to get to move like twenty three in any game. <laughs> and then I might know some game that took place in in, in Uzbekistan, which which goes to move twenty five, and they can outwit me for two and they've learned this new. The, the, the wrinkle. I, I'm not just not interested in a rat race of opening theory. I just want to get a playable position, and then uh, yeah, just play chess. That is really end. interesting. Um, your next question is: What's the best move you've ever played? Um, as what well, there's, there's two. I think there's two moves that kind of kind of stand out. Um, I mean, there, there was one. Um, there's one game. Um, I'm sorry about doing names. I wish. Strong English player, almost iron. I don't think he quite made iron, but I'm not sure. Um, oh, at an E2E4 event about, about seven years ago, eight years ago. I wish I could remember the name, but you can you can dig it out in the book anyway. And I played this move, well, I, you know, in advance, I've worked it out in advance that, that I played this move Queen D8. And um, and it and it's uh, it's on pre on, it's on the back, it's on the back, it's on pre to a rook, it's on pre to a bishop. And it's just not defended. I just place it on d8, and 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 a, and reason, and it, and it gives me an advantage. And every other move is just losing. And um and and it, and the reason that the move works is because I have to pin his rook. So it like pins his rook on e8 against his king. I have to attack his loose rook because he's attacking a loose rook of mine somewhere, and I have to attack this bishop on h4. So like queen c8 is no good. I have to put his queen to d8, and then then yeah, and then then um. It's just be bonkers. It's just on pre to everything, but it's necessary. That sounds really um, exciting. I have to so try that's and find that. You can find, yeah. I, I, I can't remember his name. Actually, just hang on a second. I'm, if, I, if I can find the position, I'll um, put that into the video yeah, for the viewers. He's in well. the game, and then you can, you can find a game more easily. But it's in, it's in, especially in Arkham's Odyssey. See, I've had that a, at home. <laughs> so I can't. Oh, I have no Back in one. Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> um... Okay, there's no excuse for not finding it now. Where is this? Where is it well, it's in our presenting. I think side put. I think side put it in our presenting. I put it in the in the back as an example of me not just bringing anything. So I think we'll find that one. Um, oh, Holland. There we go. Holland. James Holland is my first name. He's about nineteen. He's about two thousand and twelve. It's James Holland, and it was an E two E four event. I think maybe High Wycombe. So. Yeah, anyway, that was well. That was, I mean, that that was kind of maybe the best move. But I don't know. There's, there's a there's a move that some people think is better than that, which is like this this completely random position where I'm a pawn down. And I've got like a completely normal solid king size structure. I've got like h seven g six f seven. My opponent's got h four g three f two, and we just got it's very very normal position. And it's like. And I, and I play this move G G six to G five. It just looks like absolute nonsense. It's just like on pre to H. My opponent quickly played H four takes G five, and it's like, what are you playing at? And and, I, and I was play, actually I was playing on Ivanchik was on the next board. He's playing against Christian Bauer. We're playing a team event. Christian Bauer's my team and Ivanchik and the opponent's team. They were on the next board. And when I played like G five, Ivanchik was went like, oh, you kind of went jump back in his chair like, but what is this nonsense? And. Uh, but yeah, this this G five move against the guy called um, 
Gdansky, I think his name was, Gdansk or Gdansky, GM, a Polish team about 2550. And it was just, it was only, it was simply a drawing combination. It's like I start this combination with G5. He goes H takes G5. Then I'll do this C5 move on a queen side, which kind of liquidates the queen side, because I've got this really bizarre perpetual check with a queen and a knight. But it, but it has to start with this weird G5 move, which you would, if you do candidate moves, you know, like, there's some this book like Think Like a Grandmaster says talks about candidate moves. You list your candidate moves, then you choose one, then you play it. Which is the candidate moves doesn't work because um you, you got you kill creativity. If you have to just select like candidate moves and then choose one of them, you can never ever be creative because it's so all well, obvious stuff. But like this G five move, you would never find if you look at the candidate move because it I mean I've I've shown these positions to players and I said, What move should black play here? And like they've said it like They've said my move is like almost one of the last moves that they had of, out of every, every legal move in a position. So, um, but yeah, these, so, so my best moves are Queen D8, that's just Queen on pre to two different pieces, and G5 because it just looks completely nuts. It just doesn't make any sense when you see it. That sounds um, really interesting. I'll definitely have to try and dig them out. Um, but yeah, conversely, your next question is what's the worst move you've ever played? Oh, okay, that's quite trivial. That's absolutely trivial. So, I'm playing, so like in 2000 and um. Eight, I came equal first in the British Championship and then with Stuart Conquest. And then lost the next day, lost the British playoff because I was clubbing till five in the morning the day before. So I came back when it's light. There's Charlie's story who I was sharing a, sharing a flat with him once I heard it. Charlie, like, saw me. He was like, there, it's light. And I just came back about two hours to, to this playoff with Stuart Conquest. But I was so happy that I'd won, won a tournament and got the prize. I won about four and a half grand. So happy to have won, won a tournament. I wasn't even thinking about the playoff. But, um, um, so yes, so anyway, so I won, so I came in first in the British 2008, and then um, 2009, I'm like, you know, there's, there's pressure on me to kind of do well, show that I am actually that good, and then in round one, I'm playing Jack Rudd, mm. and, um, and and you know, I don't know if you've ever played Jack, but like, it's a really strange experience, because like, as soon as as soon as you move, he, he nearly always immediately moves back and then jumps out of his chair and wanders around and looks at all the other games, like he's doing a similar, like you just want to be similar opponents. And, uh, and you know, when you move, he comes scurrying back, makes his move, and then goes off again. And so, and so, it's, it's a surreal experience playing Jack. And and um, and, the, and so, I'm playing in round one of, of, of this. I think it's 2009 British. I'm pretty sure it was the following year. It might have been 2010. But anyway, is that? And and um, and and at one moment, um, I'm, I'm just thinking, where do I, where do I put my do, do I put my queen on B3 or do I put it on C3, B3 or C3? Either way, whichever one I do, I, I then play like the next movie is like a, a, a king move. It's like the next movie is forced. It's like a king move. So I go, and and then anyway, so then I, I ended up settling for B three, and then I played the I played the king move first, and like and my queen's on pre on D three. I played the king move first, and then he just like instantly stacked my queen up. He went like D three takes wherever my queen was, or E two or something. He just like, didn't even think about it or he didn't even look surprised. He just immediately stuck my queen. So I've just allowed Pawn takes queen because I'm, I'm moving in the wrong order in the British Championship. Can imagine that gave the commentators a bit. And, of... and, then, um, and then kind of in the bulletin, whoever did the bulletin, they wrote, instead of saying that, oh, Keith Arkham blundered away his queen in a, in a, when he had a slight advantage, they, said, they, they just said, the, the commentary the co just said, Jack would dis got dispatched of Keith Arkham easily in 24 moves. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's the standout worst move. But there's, there are many. There are many. Yeah, I know those moments when when you're like, okay, I have to. I've I've had times when I've been like, right, my opponent's threatening mate in one. Okay, I need to deal with this. And I just like think for half an hour and I'm playing a move that doesn't even stop the mate in one. And it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah, it can be pretty bad. That's that's painful. It's a shock, isn't it? It's a, it's a shock when <laughs> they play the play move. And you're just like, wait, I thought that, I that's not legal. That. You're just cheating. You're, you're, that's not legal. It's just nonsense. What, what's that? What's, what just happened? There's yeah. a, a horrible moment. Like, what just happened? <laughs> yeah. You got an interesting question next, um, which is, what is your biggest regret in chess? In in chess, um, it depends how you define regret. I mean, um, I mean, you could say. You mean, is it, you mean, do you mean something that I had a choice of, but I made the wrong choice? Or do you mean, do I wish something was different? Danny wrote the question. <laughs> what, what would Danny want you to say? If you, if you agree with the question, if you uphold the question, that would be your job to clarify. <laughs> um, I guess just anything to do with the chess world, something that you regret either 
actually the, over the board or an interaction with someone or playing or not playing a tournament or something, I guess. Yeah, it, it is a good question. Cool. It's a great question. I mean, um, I mean, if I mean, I'm one. I could say that um, you know, if I'd been if I'd been born in somewhere like Russia, I would have been discovered earlier on as a chess talent and you know maybe gone to quite a high level maybe even like 2750 or something or, or but you know but instead you know that, that i'd have had to be discovered at like five and have played, been placed in all the right tournaments had all the right training but instead you know so i learned to, to you know pretty much 13 tried to make a living playing weekend tournaments is no good for you never never been coached in my life so and, and that's typical of my generation so I'm kind of like i'm the worst version that i could be you know so kind of uh, yeah, uh, so I, I don't know. If I, I mean, also, I didn't. Like, I didn't kind of. Even though I was a, I'm supposed to be a professional, I've never really worked. As I said before, I didn't work at my openings. I don't think I've ever worked worked properly at the game to maximise my my results. But again, I'm not sure that's a regret because I've, I've quite enjoyed. Yeah, you know, I enjoyed the chess life. I don't, I'm not like obsessed with chess. I'm not. I mean, I guess if I wanted to just see how good I could get at the cost of everything, then then I could have. Maybe had a kind of maybe a kind of quite a boring life and been been quite a lot stronger, but I've really enjoyed kind of mixing being good at chess with just the whole social side and and, um, and you know and just um, yeah just just enjoying enjoying being a chess player, but but only not only a chess player like just the whole experience of travelling and 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 just enjoying life. But um, but I don't think that's again it's not a regret. Um, that's not a regret because uh, it's just. You know, it's given me the maximum level of, of happiness as a chess player. So, um, regret. Um, uh, it's a tough question, isn't it? It is really tough because, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I've achieved some things. I've, I've got my GM, and I've got me some these European and senior titles, you know, senior titles and everything. And I've been at a, quite a high rating at one point. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't think I have regrets. But I could I can fantasize about what could have been under different yeah. circumstances. I can kind of imagine. I can creatively imagine. You know, if, you know being coached, being learning chess younger. Um, you know, and 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 so on and so on. But but actually, I kind of the way the, the way it's gone is kind of I'm quite happy how it's gone. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I guess if I went away, it's one of the if I went away and thought about the question for a few hours, I might suddenly think, you know, I wish I'd done this or I wish I'd done that I wish I'd taken that invite or I wish I'd agreed to do that or that but like nothing nothing is obvious I mean I mean okay if okay actually I've thought of an answer it's an it, it's some, I'm, I'm gonna give you something I don't want to just not give you an answer so okay specifically in the world senior championship I've done all the hard work I've like I've been you know I've been the strong players I've, I've I, you know I think I drew with John Nunn and Stu Rua who are two of the best players and I and I beat Hebdon I beat um um, I can't remember his name now. Uh, very strong German GM, about twenty five fifty. I beat um, yeah, I beat like four or five GMs, and then yeah, you know, did everything right. Got to um, eight out of ten, which is really you know, I was like probably about twenty seven hundred before. So I got eight yeah. eight out of ten. And then I had to play like this IM in the last round, like um, twenty twenty three fifty IM, and uh, I had to have the beating to be outright world champion. And um, and, and, and at that point. I can I knew I understood the tie break. It was like some of the opponent's scores. And I had a really, really good tie break. And so I thought um, if I draw, I can't become a leading. If I draw, I'm gonna win a tournament on tie break because I'm just so far ahead. And then so and and um, and I was a tiny bit better, but it's probably gonna be a draw. And I didn't want to lose because like then I can I get knocked down to like third or fourth or something. So I kind of accepted the draw thinking I've got a good tie break. But then all the results started going against me, like one of the we, we've got four unique opponents, and the tiebreak comes down to how they do against each other. And it's like my four unique opponents all did about as badly as they could have done. And my rival for first, Stu Rua, his four unique opponents did it as well as they could have done, including the last game to finish was like the IM, the Russian IM that I beat was playing the Italian IM that he beat, and and his and and you know and, and the, the Italian IM beat the Russian IM, so that added another point to his tiebreak, and suddenly. So but it was like when I just and so suddenly I've like just you know I've given away the world senior without a fight just because I believe I had a good time break. So maybe that's counts as a regret. Yeah, just rely. Yeah, I feel like it's it's not nice when you're not really entirely in control of your own fate. 
<laughs> yeah. Just saying, yeah. I, I, the lesson is, is like if you if yeah, don't rely on a time break. If you think you got, if you are ahead and doing well on time, don't rely on it. Just play, you know, try and force it. Try and win yeah. win the game and force it. Your next question is, and I'm going to keep the exactly the same wording that Danny gave for this one. Um, it's quite funny. Do you ever get tired of playing the same stuff over and over? No. <laughs> <laughs> well no because there's, there's an infinite infinite variations in chess there's infinite possibilities near near to infinite possibilities so although it's kind of the same old stuff it's like every game's unique and um and also i enjoy i enjoy winning games in my style it's quite very satisfying it's satisfying you know playing for some kind of position achieving it resistance starts to break down and, and i and i win you know in that kind of mechanical on an autopilot kind of mechanical, you know, mechanical kind of way, it's really satisfying. I, I, I love it. I mean, I wish I, I'd, I'd, I'd take winning the next hundred games in a row in exactly the same way if I if I can win those games. I mean, I think it comes down to the result. If I if it if it works and 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 I I can grind them down doing it in a certain way, then then great. But I mean, but it's like you can't control it chess like that. I mean, I've loads of really sharp tactical games, especially with black. I mean, I get into all sorts of trouble with black, and, and I've all sorts of horrible struggles. So yeah, I, I mean, think Danny was just digging a bit because he likes to vary things up and gets bored pretty quickly. Of yeah, he gets bored quickly. Yeah, I mean, he gets he, then, then he gets frustrated quickly. I think, but um, I, I'm I think I've got probably got more, more a lot more well a lot more patience than Danny. Like you know, I, I'm I can very I can very happily sit there for hours and hours and hours with a tiny little edge, thinking that the most likely outcome is a draw, but I've got a small chance of winning, and I'll you know I'm happy to do spend four hours trying to extract that that our situation. Be after Danny's. Danny's got well. We just very different styles. I mean, Danny's yeah. got absolutely brilliant with the initiative and very resourceful in defence. So on and so on. But yeah. Okay. So, if you had to be stuck in a lift with a chess player, who would it be and why? I've been I've been in a lift with Ivanchuk. It's kind of he <laughs> <laughs> kind of just he kind of jumped he kind of jumped in looked at the looked at the city of the of the of the, of the, of the lift and then jumped out again <laughs> sprang out again was, it's a little bit exactly how he plays chess like when he plays when i played i actually played him when he was world number two briefly it was a moment he happened to be world number two at 27 eight, seven. and it's like and it was i was playing him and he was like he was when it was my move he was staring at the board really intensely when it was his move he took he'd be, he, he was just looking up at the ceiling and then make his move and then when the game finished, he just jumped away, sprung away like a little bouncy, <laughs> bouncy thing. It's really curious. But that, I don't know what the answer is. Who would I want? Who do I want to be stuck in a lift with? It depends if they'll talk to me. What about if I'm going to have some famous player, but then they just stand there frustrated and <laughs> waiting for them to get off the lift? So, um, I'm coming up, you know, I know I was at a prize game with Kasparov. He was kind of, he was interested in chat. So he'd been presented with, some, with European Championship, so I got a lot of chat with Kasparov. Karpov, Karpov looks like a nice guy. I mean, does, does this include only chess players, or do you mean anybody on the planet? He says chess players. So. Oh, it's got to be a chess player, okay. Um, and do they have to be alive? That wasn't specified, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go with some ghosts in the chat. I mean, if I'm allowed to talk about like, Im just imagine that I'm like going back into the past in a time machine, and I'm, and I'm in in like the well, no, maybe they didn't have lifts in the time machine. Old fashioned lifts. Old fashioned lifts. Then, uh, then I, it might. I think it might be interesting to talk to players like historical characters, like um, like Capablanca, or even going back to like Morphy, and just just see what they think about chess and see how they think about chess, because you know. it's that, that, you know, just you know, so far ahead of their time, but yeah, they don't know anything. Like, they don't know a lot of the stuff that we know now. So, objectively, by today's standard, they're not actually that great. Mm -hmm. But but they're, they're, they're just an amazing achievement while they did at their time. So, just kind of talking to them about chess, interesting. But um, I know I, uh, I can't I can't I can't think of because I the people that I mean, if I want to talk to someone, I'll just talk to them. I don't need to be in a lift. With them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a strange one to answer. <laughs> Um, um, I don't know. I can't answer it. Um, they'll ignore me, whoever it is, anyway. So yeah, no, that's, that's as good as I can give them a fry. Fair enough. Um, how long do you think you'll be a chess professional for? Oh, at least another fifty years. Until you, until you go to the grave. <laughs> <That's not high. laughs>
I don't know. No, I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a funny label because I, I, mean, I call myself a professional. I guess at the moment I, you know, I do earn enough to, to, for that to be reasonable. But like, maybe, the, maybe, maybe, it, when do you, when are you not a professional? I mean, I'll always, I guess I'll always be involved in chess. I'll always want I'll always be invited to do simuls probably while I can still walk and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, um, uh, you know, I, I'll be invited to tournaments. So as a GM, I'll probably still get invites whenever I want them. So, what counts as giving up? I mean, does is does that count? You mean like when I have nothing more to do with chess? What about if I sit at home and just just playing online chess, or or if I start just reading, just writing about chess, or just coaching? Would that count? So, I don't know. Or do you, you? I guess Danny probably means. I guess he probably means like not playing tournaments because I'm known for playing tournaments. So I've known mm. for, you know, for 45 years. I've been playing tournaments, so he probably means when am I going to stop doing that? And I don't know. He'll bury you um, with a chess set. You can play. What was that? Bury you with a chess set, and you can play even after you're gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I yeah, know, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. It would be lovely, know, it'll be sorry, lovely if you do stick around because obviously you're so strong, and if you did stop playing, then you lose like a regular GM from the circuit. So. Yeah, I, I kind of know a lot about chess, and I'm friends with loads of players and stuff. So I think I'm doing this. But no, I mean, and I, 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 yeah, I, just, I, I have no thoughts about stopping playing because I enjoy it too much. I can't, I can't even. Something dramatic would have to change with me to, to that not to be the case, as far as I can see ahead. So, uh. fair enough. Uh, we've got one last question for you, which is, what is your favourite chess book? But you're not allowed to say Arkle's End Games. I wouldn't anyway. I'm not that cocky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say Danny's <laughs> Anarchy. <laughs> Danny will really enjoy it too much. Um, Oh goodness! I don't. I mean, what books have I got? I mean, favorite chess book. I mean, I mean, I mean, Jonathan Hawkins's book is a good one. Amateur to I am. I love that I think, one. That's really good. I think it's just like you know, he, he kind of yeah, because I'm an end, end games player, and, and it's kind of like yeah, he focuses on using end games to get better at chess. I think that's, I think it's very instructive and well written, mm. and um, so yeah, I like I like I like Hawk's book. Um, so I've not read many chess books. It sounds bonkers. I've not read many <laughs> books. I've not read many chess books. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's a different kind of book which I quite enjoy. Uh, um, I mean, Rouston's Rouston's Chess for Zebras is very. I'm good. reading that at the moment. I oh, like great! It's, yeah, it's really, it's you know, it's kind of it's, it's intellectually stimulating. You know, he it, 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 it writes very intellectually and uh, deeply about it. And, not, and it's not only chess. He writes kind of you know, plays chess to it, well, you know, to other stuff. Um, so that's that's good, and and um, uh, oh, and and also um, I, I mean, again, I, I can't. I happen to be in these books, but it's really honestly not because I'm in them. And that's the books <laughs> by, by 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 Natasha and um and uh, and um and and um, what's, what's happened to my brain? Matthew, <laughs> Matthew yes, that's really bad. <laughs> but um, the books by Natasha and Matthew are, are really really good. I mean, I think I mean I I, I think Chess for Life is a really good book. Not that it's not, you know, it's, it's written as if it's a book for, for players who are getting who are kind of getting a little bit older, but it's actually it's got a really a lot of good stuff about the understanding of chess in there. And um, and they've done even a brilliant two brilliant chapters on my own chess. Kind of like, but they've magnified it because Matthew's such a strong player and Natasha does some great research as well. But Matthew's so strong that he's actually like he sh- he's shone sh- 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 a light on like my chess and the chess of all the other players in the book. That's a really bright light because he's so strong. So he analyzes his games and puts his own understanding, and 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 it kind of brings his games to life and and um, really really instructive. So I actually really enjoy chess chess for life. The order chapters. I'm not just bragging because <laughs> that mean that. Um, but yeah, I'm not that well read chess wise, so I can't really. I, I imagine there's some great. I mean, there's classic books like um, Fisher's book, and, yeah, memorable games and. Uh, and, and, and annotations like Zorik 53. There's these kind of classical books, and uh, which, are, which are, yeah, you enjoy them when you read, when you first read them, you enjoy them. Uh, and, um, but I, I didn't like My System, which, you know, it's like a famous book, but I really didn't like My System by Nimzovich. I thought it was too regimental. I thought players aren't like that. Players, players you don't really go to the board with, with kind of like, Absolute rules that you're going to hit, adhere to to get the point. You, you're in a struggle, and you, yeah, you just, just you're just trying to survive, and you're trying to analyze your way out of trouble, and you're trying to find some ideas to make difficult things difficult for your opponent. 
but that's what Nimswitch writes about it as if it's kind of like it's a, and like a mathematical puzzle or something. So I don't really like my system. And the same goes for Think Like a Grandmaster. I think, again, that's too famous book, but I think it's too regimental. It's too kind of like you always have to behave like this and you always have to, as I mentioned earlier, you always have to kind of um, list candidate moves. As I said before, I don't like that. It just creates, it just kills creativity. Yeah, it's like, because as I said, I'm reading Chess with Zebras and I like what he says in that about the problem people have with improving is they think too much about sort of knowledge and r rules that you have in chess and things like oh give them isolated pawns and it's like it's not always worth doing um or yeah I, I, this is something i was talking about on commentary with danny when you get a position where you're a pawn up and beginner players might just immediately start trying to exchange everything because that's what they've been taught but it's not necessarily the best way to do it so Exactly, yeah. And I think you also have to, like, I think, I'm, I'm sure Rouse and Touch is, um, like, you should, like, stimulate your creativity wherever possible. And to do that, you need to be free of all rules. You need to be, like, thinking completely originally, at, like, just no no kind of concepts, no kind of prejudices or anything, but just have a completely free mind to wonder about all, all yeah, and ideas. Yeah, calculate the position rather than... Yeah, calculate the unique position in front of you and don't impose rules on it. So, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, anybody who writes like that, and Rouse is a good example, really, is... is Yes, my um, endorsement. Okay, I think that's all my questions. So thank you so much for coming along. Um, to anyone watching this, I hope you enjoyed. Um, put in the comments if you have any more questions that you'd love for Keith to answer. I'm sure he will try and respond to some. Um, Absolutely. And see you all in the next video. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks for inviting me.